So the test is really, well, the diagnosis is to have, take the history and examine the patient with a good, you know, proper history, proper examination, and a uh, good light just to exclude um, any subtle skin problems, which should be visible, yeah. Oh, just worth mentioning the Q-tip swab, actually. I mean, that's sometimes talked about as the test for vestibular dynia. That's when you would you would use a, a Q-tip swab. Uh, it's a very poor test, actually, where you, but it, it's one of the tests that's commonly used. We just use a Q-tip swab and we touch the area around the vulva vestibule, the inner part of the labia minora. And that, uh, uh, that may demonstrate something called allodynia, which is excessive, uh, a perception of pain, excess pain on gentle touch, such as stroking. And that's a sign of nerve ending pains. That is a test that can be done, uh, which supports a, a diagnosis of vestibular dynia. All right. So in terms of um, best treatment, best care for vulvodynia, what is that at the moment? How would you treat it successfully? Um, yeah, um, that, 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 is, that remains an ongoing challenge. I think the first thing to say is that um, the individual needs of uh, a woman with vulval pain and lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, um, and all, all the sort of all the conditions that our sort of attendees have um, indicated they have, the, the needs vary uh, because there, there is a spectrum of disease. There is a spectrum of min very minimal symptoms. Uh, a lichen sclerosis, for example, can be asymptomatic um, in a very small number of women, but very very symptomatic in others. Um, uh, but uh, vulvodynia can, again, some women can have very minimal pain and function quite normally in society without complaints or, or impact on function. And then so that others will be disabled significantly by it. So in terms of accessing the best treatment, um, you've going to have to decide where, where, that, where, where the treatment options might be for that individual. So it's back to the assessment, isn't it? So ideally, we would have a history, an examination uh, of the patient, and we would that history would be very detailed. It would look at um, the level of pain, the, the, the pain descriptors, burning, aching, rawness, soreness, etc. It would look at um, it would look at the impact on function, day to day life, working. Uh, it would. Be about social interaction, psychosexual issues. And then once you've done that very rich history, which I think takes on average a minimum, really about half an hour to do. I mean, that is a luxury in the NHS, but it does take about half an hour to get all that information. Mm. And you can decide with the patient what you want to do. Um, because I've got patients with very few symptoms and I can offer them all of the tests, all of the, sorry, the treatments available, which are drugs, physiotherapy, psychosexual therapy. And some women will say, well, thank you, Dr. Nunes, that's, that's fine. But at this moment in time, I will just have an open appointment. I'm actually self-managing um, or any strategy uh, that suits the individual is fine. So self-management is for some. Others will want to take everything um, that's available. Um, uh, and I think the challenges for, in terms of the best treatment is at least having that assessment and then having that discussion. We call it the shared decision-making process. And we talk about the pros and the cons, basically. Um, and for example, amitriptyline, great drug, bad drug. <laughs> uh, but um, for some it's great, for others it's not great. But it, it's a conversation about the expectations of those drugs and how they work and their value. So that's the challenge, and we don't have that in the NHS at the moment, which is why we sit at the VPS, because it hopefully enables women to look beyond their standard health professional to look at all the other options yeah. that we can yeah. talk about. And let's talk about some of those treatment routes. So you spoke about amitriptyline there. 
Uh, one of the questions that has been sent in is uh, if amitriptyline has stopped being effective in pain management, would you recommend trying other medications? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, when, we, when, when doctors, health professionals look at um, interventions in chronic pain, we, we try and look at randomized kind of controlled trials. Uh, we have an intervention, a drug, uh, any, anything really, cream, ointment, um, take our group of patients, toss a coin, and then uh, and one person gets the drug and the other person gets the placebo. And uh, that's how medicine evolves. And we, we know that with, the, with randomized control trials in chronic pain, that the placebo effect or the dummy treatment has quite a high success rate. Um, uh, and a lot of the interventions, such as the, the, the drugs that we use, also have a high success rate. But generally, that there may be something quite limited in terms of the, the benefits of the treatment. That might be nothing more than 50, 60% of patients benefiting from it, as well as the high placebo rates as well. And those studies are often quite short term, so that long, long term, we don't know what happens. And also with chronic pain, we've got another, we've got lots of other options, haven't we? We've got the, the mood status of the patient, the, 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 the level of, um, anxiety, stress, other factors such as function, work, etc., that complicate the matter. So it's un it's hard to pick out the drug as as one drug being um, the best, as it were. Um, so amitriptyline is it's it's a very old drug. It's been around for years. It's prescribed for no end of chronic pain problems uh, in general practice, um, and. Uh, it, it does work for, for many women, but not all. Uh, it, and it doesn't, um, I, d I wouldn't say it would cure the pain. Uh, it's not a curative treatment, uh, but it may significantly reduce the, the perception of pain, the level of pain, potentially the level of the number of flare ups as well. What does that mean? It means that people may be more active, more mobile, they might sleep better, uh, they may do things that they used to do routinely more often, so the function can improve. Does that mean then, David, if the patient comes off amitriptyline, is there a likelihood that the pain might return, or would that be enough? Well, we, uh, we've always felt, um, in my practice up in Nottingham, and um, I think it echoes around the the, the, the country with with pain pain management teams, that the 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 amitriptyline is only one of many strategies that a patient should try. So rather than the the drug in isolation, uh, you you would try gentle exercise. You would try um, perhaps changing diet. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, setting goals, um, breathing exercises, pelvic floor rehab, all these um, other strategies together. So the combination is that you actually improve things. So what uh, overall, it, I mean, we call it a sandwich of care. So you add things like a sandwich and you, you add all these different strategies in to make this overall package. Um, so the, the amitriptyline, as a singled out intervention is, is difficult to unpick if all these other things are improving. Because what you want to do is essentially shut down the, the central and the peripheral nervous system um, from a pain perspective. You're trying to dampen down the perception, the feeling of pain um, through reduced pain signal amplification. So if you're stressed and anxious and worried, the pain signal goes up because the central and the peripheral nervous system open up um, whereas if you're relaxed, for whatever reason, meditation, breathing, exercises, uh, um, uh, whatever, mindfulness, then the pain, then the, hopefully the pain, the perception is less through the central nervous system shutting down. So to unpick the drug is hard. Um, I would say that um, the drugs, the, the, the amitriptyline benefit 
isn't an overnight thing. So it, it, you generally have to give the drug a bit of time to work if you're making a commitment to it. Um, and I, I think that the, 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 certainly more than a couple of months might be worth considering. So something that's within a month, it seems quite a short period of time for the drug because you've got to escalate the dose to the level that suits the patient um, and for it to work. And you've got to sort of manage to negotiate the side effects, which might be sort of constipation, et cetera. So it, I hope that's answered the question a long way around, but basically the drugs can work, but they've got to work optimally before they're stopped, I think. Often the drugs are given and they're stopped within a few days of treatment. And I don't think that generally uh, is enough time for the mm. day a drug's worked. So at least a couple of months, really. And, and this sandwich of care, we'll dig into it a little bit deeper in a moment. Um, before we do, a, another one of these, qu another question that's come in, how can I get a diagnosis if the GPs keep giving me the same medications all the time, even if they don't work? Yeah, th th this is this is difficult, isn't it? Um, the, the the there is no accreditation process for a health professional to complete to be able to say I can diagnose vulvodynia and I can manage a woman with a vulval problem. So, for example, cancer oncology is is um, if you have a cancer of a certain part of the body, you are you are referred by a very defined pathway into a into a cancer team specialist team so and that's that's very easy uh, in many ways with with, with chronic pain um and vul which in, includes vulvodynia we, we are i would say that all health professionals involved with the management of women should be able to take a history and examine the patient and start basic treatment and back to that sort of spectrum of women some women have few problems others have many the more complicated women need to go to the specialist teams i think i would say in this question that you've given me there's a concern that there is no diagnosis and there is treatment now if that treatment not sure of the detail but if that's treatment for symptoms that's sort of back to front i would expect a diagnosis first Vulvodynia. You've excluded all the other conditions we talked about at the beginning, skin disease, infection, and then the diagnosis is made and then the treatment is based on the diagnosis. I mean, that's good medical practice. That's what we should do. We don't tend to just, we don't just, I don't generally, we don't tend to throw treatments one after the other at, um, at a condition which doesn't have a diagnosis. That's something we should not to do. If there's no diagnosis, then ideally uh, the individual needs to see a specialist. So the, the BSSVD has a, a website, British Society for the Study of Vulval Disease, and there is a list of vulval clinics there on that site. Now, I'm not suggesting everyone goes to the, one of those clinics because we, we can't um, sort of uh, endorse what those clinics as being a clinic that uh, will give you what you need because uh, they're all different clinics but that's a start um, it may be worth asking a health professional for another opinion if you haven't got a diagnosis yeah right right okay and how would you go about um, getting a referral perhaps to a, a clinic or a multidisciplinary team uh, so did you self-refer to one of these clinics you're talking about on the BSSVD site or would you need to go through the GP? Uh, good question. So, so the, the, let me tell you about the clinics first of all. So the clinics um, are run by gynaecologists, dermatologists, sexual health doctors, G physicians. They may be run in isolation. Um, they may be run as a, what's called a multidisciplinary cl clinic where there's two individuals in the room. So for example, some of our listeners are, have got lichen sclerosis and lichen planus. Um, they, so those are skin conditions. Um, and 
lichen sclerosis, we're estimating around up to three in a hundred women have that. Um, so it's not uncommon. Um, and lichen planus um, on the vulva, but perhaps slightly less. So a dermatologist stroke gynecologist, you might think is the, the right person for that, for that individual. Uh, and that's, that's true. A lot of GPs, however, will manage lichen sclerosis quite effectively. Uh, and similarly, vulval pain, you might want to see, you might assume that a pain specialist is the person that you need to see. Well, again, vulvodynia is, I think we've got a, a, a background rate of pain, um, a lifetime risk of something like up to 16%. It's very common vulval pain. Again, we can't expect these clinics to see all of the women um, uh, with vulval pain. So we, it's, the, it's a sort of distribution of, uh, uh, of care across the whole of the health professionals and the clinics are um, quite concentrated and probably should be dealing with the more complex patients. Things haven't settled. So you can ask for a referral to the hospital, uh, Volvo Clinic. You might get referred to general gynecology, general dermatology or sexual health. Sexual health have a very valued resource where you can walk in you essentially can walk in so if you think you've got thrush or discharge or something you feel it needs an acute referral or, a, or a, an assessment most have a walk-in service and the doctors there are of great value in the nurses and you'll get a history examination swab and then often they will do the microscopy or the microscope examination there and then so that's a sort of walk-in service um, they, uh, half the patients I think that they see don't have sexually transmitted diseases, you know, they're, 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 the other half do so that, you know, they deal a lot with people concerned about sexual health. Um, GPs might be referred to the, not to the sexual health clinic, but to gynecology, dermatology. So that might be worth asking a GP for referral. Uh, it's an ongoing problem in terms of access in these clinics. Uh, as I say, they're very variable. Accessing an MDT, a multidisciplinary team, now that, that's not generally what would happen, but you go into a clinic and then some of the clinics would have a multidisciplinary team right. who would then discuss your case now, uh, from a team perspective and then decide what, what that individual's care plan, you could, might call it, would be. Do you need to see the physio, sex therapist? Do you need to see CBT therapists, etc.? Okay. Can we talk a little bit about topical treatments? Um, and if we start with um, perhaps thrush to begin with, um, there's a uh, someone has asked, my problem started after an intense course of thrush treatment, and the skin is consistently raw it's never been the same are there thrush treatments that don't make vulval pain worse uh yep common common issue isn't it thrush i mean thrush candida is a yeast commonly present in the vagina vulva vaginal area um i suppose the big question is it a is it a misdiagnosis when it is picked up is it a red herring if you think that thrush is present in is, is commonly present in the vagina and you've got symptoms if you pick the swab up if you take a swab and you pick thrush upon a swab is it truly relevant or is it just a a, a fact that one in three women have thrush in the vagina Gen generally by and large thrush candidiasis is um uh, when it's when it when it um when there's too much of it uh, causes irritation and uh discharge so it's an irritation itch primarily leading to secondary pain and discharge so and, and i think that's the classic attack that gps often see and then it's treated and it goes so for a woman with persistent vulval pain um in the absence of the irritation the discharge who's got thrush on a swab but the question is is it relevant is it something else um, uh, recurrent thrush is more than six attacks a year, but these are, are usually quite finite 
num finite attacks of thrush that tend to respond to antifungal. I mean, that's the point, really, because the one of the, that's an important point because candida yeast usually responds incredibly well to antifungal. So we talk about sometimes drug, uh, drug resistant yeast. Um, it's not very common at all that. So I think that getting self, taking self swabs, that's what we do up in Nottingham. We give swabs to the, to the woman to take herself. She takes them when she's symptomatic, puts them in the packet and sends them into us and we process them. And if all, I guess if all the swabs were positive uh, over a period of time, then that may, may have some relevance and we would treat with a sort of maintenance dose of antifungal diflucan or uh, the, the over-the-counter products that you can get um, antifungal treatments. And more information on that is from the NICE guidance on recurrent thrush, NICE guidance on the website. And there's a good clear regime that GPs would follow. Um, and if all the swabs are negative, then you think, well, actually, is it, is it thrush? And, and we, we might have to reconsider that thrush isn't the problem. Again, all those studies have been done in the past where people have taken biopsies and looked at microscopically for any hidden yeast and it's not, it's not shown any. Because the candida that is so easily grown on a swab, yeah, it doesn't lurk under the tissues and that. Okay, all right. I guess one thing to say, sorry, Sharon, is that canistin creams and pessaries may potentially be irritants on the skin, if that's oh. So we tend to right. get oral treatment. Yeah. So you would go for antifungals? Yes. Yeah. 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 So in terms of creams for um, dryness and extreme sensitivity, what would you recommend creams what, what wise for the vulva? So uh, uh, just, just as a rule of thumb, uh, genital skin is uh, it, it's more prone to skin conditions than other surfaces of the body. It's more prone to drying out uh, uh, because it, the skin is thinner um, than elsewhere. When I say thinner, anatomically thinner, genital skin is penis, vulva. Um, it, 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 it is a sensitive skin surface, um, and also very relevant is that for women who've gone through the menopause, there is the additional lack of vaginal estrogen. Uh, and that might uh, compound some of the issues we've talked about, pain and irritation. So I think um, uh, these, are, these are what we call physiological factors in, in the skin that make it a special sort of skin surface. So as a, as a rule of thumb, when you've got symptoms, um, the, the, the blander the better. So uh, scented products, um, uh, over-the-counter products have a lot of hidden scent uh, in them so we, we all the baby products that you might um, assume are low allergy do have hidden scent so the, the blander the better and uh, if there is dryness then a moisturizer uh, is, is fine what's the best moisturizer well it's the one that an individual will use um, so there's no true one superior moisturizer except the ointments which are greasy tend to be better than creams that are less greasy but easier to apply and they're better than lotions which are very easy to apply but don't last very long so ointments yes worth a trial a bit of trial and error which is the best one aqueous cream cream you can put on but you have to take it off uh, because it, it, we tend to take it's got something called sodium laurel sulfate in which uh, can irritate the skin in some individuals. So ointments um, is, are, are worth of worth considering. Obviously, it's a core treatment for LS and LP. Um, uh, estrogen replacement, if you've gone through the menopause or going through the menopause, again, is very safe uh, in terms of pessaries. Um, Estrogen creams can be irritating. Worth a go though, in terms of trying to reverse vaginal atrophy, if that's there, or lack of estrogen. Um, other than that, I mean, we give steroid ointments to lichen sclerosis, steroid ointments to lichen planus. 
the other things for vulvodynia, vagina, vulvodynia, and vestibular dynia are anesthetic ointments and gabapentin gels. Mm. Um, there aren't huge, uh, there aren't hidden creams available that we are using that are top secret that we never share or we can't get hold of. Um, those, are by and large, the commonest things we use. Um, as I say, we, we shy away a lot from topical treatments because the skin's so sensitive. So, yeah. Someone has asked about topical gabapentin on the NHS, um, how to get hold of it if the GP doesn't know about it. Yeah, uh, the uh, so gabapentin gel, yes, gabapentin, a pain modifying drug. It's um, it's uh, um, it's been around for a long time. That gabapentin gel. It's a topical treatment applied to the area of pain. Um, I gather it's made up in St Mary's Hospital in Cardiff um, uh, by the pharmacy department there, and uh, uh, it, it may need a bit of detective work to try and enable that prescription. Um, it, it was in the past very expensive, but I think it's come down in price now, and it and it lasts longer, twice a day, given um, applied to the vulval area, um, avoids the systemic side effects that you might receive uh, with a tablet in, gab in gabapentin form. In terms of evidence, good clinical trials, it's, it's with no randomized trials, but um, perhaps they're going to happen at some point. Um, but yes, St. Mary's Hospital Cardiff might have to ask the GP for um, a, um, a, a prescription. Uh, if not, email us at the BPS. And I, I think We've had this inquiry a few times that we can sort of point people in the right direction. I'm okay. sure. Yeah. Great, great. And you mentioned um, estrogen replacement pessaries. Um, does that mean hormone creams are safe to use if you have LS, vulvodynia, vestibulodynia, LP? Uh, again, good question. So um, they they work for many for not for all and they are licensed predominantly for um, a, a genital atrophy following the menopause um, so dryness irritation uh, symptoms after uh, during and after the menopause we, we wouldn't normally give it to a premenopausal woman um, because the estrogen levels should be normal having um, uh, having normal ovarian function so it, it's that it's these symptoms develop after the menopause. So there is minimal absorption of these drugs when applied topically or in pessaries. Um, so Vagifem pessaries are pessaries that are delivered nightly for 14 days into the vagina and then twice a week maintenance um, uh, uh, as, a, as a, at least a three month course. Um, it said that um, a year's worth of this treatment is equivalent to one tablet by mouth of estrogen. Um, so they are, my point is that even though they are a hormone, um, there is very little general absorption. So in Nottingham where I work, we give the treatment to women who've had breast cancer, for example, uh, where even if they have an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, we still give them estrogen pessaries and creams. So they're quite safe, and so I think it's it is a trial and error uh, um, uh, treatment um, if you've got a vulval problem. But even uh, it, it, it's worth having a conversation with the doctor about having them uh, if you're peri or postmenopausal. Yeah. And I know that on the webinar today there are a number of women with LS and LP that have joined and also registered. Um, to receive the recording of the webinar and just to let everyone know that next Friday the 17th at 2 p.m. we'll be running another Q&A with more of a focus on those areas of lichen sclerosis and, and lichen planus so we can dive a bit deeper into those areas. So for today then can we have a chat about physio and the pelvic floor? side of things, the pelvic floor muscles. Um, one of the questions uh, that 
has been asked by a number of people is about tight pelvic floor muscles. Is it the massive cause of pain? Well, I suppose, yes. I mean, it, I, uh, w the big change over the years is the integration of physiotherapy, women's health physiotherapy, into the multidisciplinary team managing women with vulvodynia, particularly difficult vulvodynia. And actually, we talked about LS and LP. I see someone's got pudendal neuralgia. There are sort of overlaps with those conditions because the pelvic floor response to pain can be to shorten and tighten the muscles. Mm. So the response to pain is to protect um, over a period of time, perhaps over three months, three months or more, um, the response is to shorten and tighten the muscles and 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 this in itself can you might call it perpetuate the pain cycle yeah mm -hmm. so somebody has vag three people have got vaginismus as well i mean that's a that that, that, that there's a bit of blurring of the lines here we we we, we can't uh, doctors like things in compartments and um, they like to have very fixed um thinking with a lot of uh, things in medicine um uh, and I guess patients do as well. We like to think about things uh, in different compartments, but actually pelvic floor transcends all these diagnoses, I think, and, and has great value in terms of at least having the pelvic floor muscles addressed. But um, the, the muscles are, are a complex set of muscles. Um, it's, they are essentially a, a very dynamic muscle that moves all the time when you open a bowels and pass water. Uh, they change with intercourse and arousal. Um, and there are lots of different muscles wrapped up individually in their own fascia or their membrane. And we don't truly know whether it's the chicken or egg. Does the pain in the vulva lead to a tightening of the muscle? Or does the tightening in the muscle lead to the perception of pain in the vulva? And I suspect for some women with, with vulvodynia, it's a bit of both, really. Now, now we've got we've got vulvodynia is a wide group of women, as I mentioned. There are some women who've got largely central processes going on in the brain. Yeah, so there's the central sensitization. These are women who've got lots of other pain syndromes, temporomandibular joint problems. They might have irritable bowel syndrome. They might have um, other uh, painful mouth syndrome where they get sore tongue. So it's there is a problem with the pain center in the brain. And there are other women who've got peripheral nerve problems in the skin, the vestibular dynia patients. The problems are on the skin. Um, and then there's this other group of women with pelvic floor muscle problems. Um, you know, where are the clues? Well, um, is it a muscle problem? Well, sometimes in the history, there may be a history of childhood problems passing urine. Yeah. So if the pelvic floor has been tight for years um, into adulthood, it may be that the, ur the bladder doesn't come out with a good flow. There might be drips and drabs. When you have a wee, you might be getting up several times a night. It may be that you have a good wee and then you think the bladder's empty and then 20 minutes later, you've got a nip to the loo again to empty it again. Uh, and that's a sign of incomplete bladder emptying. So those are the clues in the history. Um, constipation as well, very bad constipation over many years, might be pelvic floor related. And so when, this, when a pain syndrome comes, vulvodynia for example, it's very important to just at least have an assessment of the pelvic floor uh, by a physio. Not, not a, a sort of a, um, a rugby playing, a, a rugby playing musculoskeletal physiotherapist called Bert, who's never seen the vulva, <laughs> but you know, we're talking about a woman's health physio and a woman's health physio with an interest in pain, a pain assessment. And there are, there's the Squeezy app on uh, the Squeezy, which is on, I think our website, which is an NHS supported um, uh, uh, physio finding app or website where you can tap in your postcode, mention, not specifically so much bladder weakness, but, uh, but pain, and you might get directed to the right person. So that's quite a good resource. Because it's not, 
it's not weakness. It's not, it's different to a weak bladder. It's, it's a, the muscles are too tight. Okay. How are you um, spelling squeezy? Uh, I think it's S Q U E E Z Y. All right. So, okay. So it's no. Is it a word? Squeezy. Yeah. Okay. Squeezy. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm mindful that we're getting on in time, you know, in, in terms of time. So um, we've got some nervous system questions, which I think you really answered and covered before. Um, the questions were to do with how do you calm down the nervous system without uh, antidepressants or anticonvulsants? And you mentioned mindfulness, diaphragmatic breathing. Um, anything else you'd recommend on those on those fronts to calm down the nervous system? I guess I guess the, the, the it, over the years working with the team at the VPS and speaking to patients, there are so many different strategies. So just off the top of my head, um, let's take away the drugs and the physio and the and formal psychosexual therapy. Um, women are saying to me, I read, I do yoga, I go for a run, I've tried acupuncture, I've got a TENS machine uh, that I use that I bought over the counter, I've changed my diet, I've, um, I, drink, I don't drink alcohol as much, um, I... Um, um, uh, I changed my partner, I changed my job, you know, there's, there's the whole thing, there's a whole mixture of uh, rich individual experiences that you wouldn't see in a medical journal uh, yeah. that led or paid, that, that contributed in somehow, however big or little, to that woman getting better. Um, I, I mean, things that stick out are exercise, actually. I have to say that the sort of the, the, the gentle stretches that Amy Stein's book, which is um, on, on healing pelvic pain, I thought it was a great book because it, it just suddenly introduces for many women who are quite disabled by the pain, the concept of gentle exercises. I mean, those are things that are worth, try, worth, worth trialing, really, because um, I think there's value. And I mentioned acupuncture for some for unprovoked pain, not for, for the vestibular dynia, but you know, these are things that might help. Okay. Um, the research is quiet though, Sharon, at the moment, there's not a huge mm. on the internet uh, in, in, in medical publications. Um, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't have that sort of information in, in published studies. Mm. And I imagine that would be the same for uh, things like Botox um, and the Mona Lisa treatment, things like that too, that the, evidence isn't isn't there yet the, you're, you're absolutely right the evidence isn't there uh, the the botox is um again an age-old treatment used largely with for um uh migraine overactive bladders it's used in chronic pain clinics a lot it's a poison um and it relaxes muscle lasts for three months and it's given as an injection and um uh, it it does seem to have some benefit in for tight pelvic floor muscles. So um, for someone who's had an injury, for example, or maybe that's a, a, or a postnatal issue, and they've got um, a tight, short pelvic floor muscle, levator muscle, we call that. Um, and it's a very specific knot of muscle, you might call it, or tight band of muscle, then the, the physios can feel. And uh, they, the, the, the in Botox injection probably works. There's a few studies injecting it into the skin, not the muscle, the skin in women with provoked vestibular dynia that you can read about on the internet. Um, and these, those were published last year. If our, if our listeners want more information on that, we can talk about that again. Um, but they are there. There's a couple of papers um, that talk about Botox, but they're not, randomized controlled trials where we toss a coin. Um, you mentioned the Mona Lisa therapy, which is licensed for, I gather, for atrophy after the menopause, vulval vaginal atrophy, lack of estrogen. Um, it encourages the skin to uh, change in texture and be less atrophic and produces symptoms, uh, improves symptoms through a process of a laser treatment. It's, it's CO2 fractionated laser outpatient treatment. That's um, not shown to be a value in, in 
chronic pain. So I, I, would, I would not suggest it at this moment in time, although maybe that's a treatment option. Same for LS and LP. There is some, um, there has been some concern that it, it uh, is not a benefit for patients. Um, so at this moment in time, perhaps uh, to be mindful of the fact that, that that treatment is not shown to be working uh, for, those, for all these conditions. But that might change with clinical trials that may be set up in the future. Yeah. So to wrap up, David, and I'm mindful that we haven't got through all of the questions, but we have got through the vast majority of them, um, or certainly touched upon them. And as I mentioned, next week we will have another Q&A um, to cover any of the questions we didn't answer and the opportunity for more questions to be asked. In your experience, David, when uh, a woman um, has this sandwich of care and they've identified all the different elements that might be useful, um, will that patient generally be able to return to a good quality of life? So in terms of, of healing, getting back to doing the things that are important to them? Well, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm very hopeful that the vast majority of women can can get back to a uh, an improvement in their function. What is functions? Everything we do day to day, isn't it? Putting our clothes on and and um, brushing our teeth uh, and 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 doing all the things that we would hope to do as part of being a, a citizen of our society. Going out of the house and and that doesn't include function includes working potentially it, 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 for, for, well for most of us we we have to work um so an improvement in in function a reduction in symptoms um sort of less pain less discomfort um to a level where uh, symptoms have either gone or are manageable and then also this issue of self-management and that that an individual would know what the triggers are, what what causes a flare-up, and can this be uh, avoided? So that's relevant to LS, LP, vulvodynia, um, and 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 also, I guess, uh, an element of happiness attached to that. You know, some impact on mood because all that may be there and may be improving, but um, I, get, I, I guess mood and how you feel is all crucially linked to, to the whole package. So does it, so those are the outcomes we look at. Um, uh, I had one patient, she was desperate to, to work. I mean, her outcome that she really wanted was to work because she needed the money uh, and, and vulvodynia had stopped her working. So with low dose amitriptyline, um, she, uh, the pain went from eight out of 10 on a pain scale down to five out of 10. And that was enough for her to, um, to begin to work. So her pain was five out of 10. It wasn't zero out of 10, but the outcome for her was that she could work. Uh, so, you know, that's a, that, that would be an improvement for that patient, not perfect. Um, so I'm, I would say that, I would say in our practice, I would say perhaps more than seven out of 10 women have quite significant improvement in their overall experience of, uh, of their pain with that sandwich of treatment. Uh, lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, perhaps a little higher even than that, um, but it's, ne it's not 100%. So, but I'd like to think most of them are, are going to do, um, most of the women are gonna have some improvement, small or significant. Um, and I see people many years down the line and they are getting better um, or they've adapted slightly to, to their pain. Um, and so I, uh, in, living in Nottingham in the East Midlands, there is a fairly stable population. And I think, um, I don't think uh, we see, um, I see, you know, see, I see quite a stable cohort of women who, can, who, who most of whom have an open appointment. Um, I mean, it might, it might be true that we just don't know what long-term things are for, for many of the women, because I'm sure they get fed up of seeing me sometimes, but 
I mean, they do have open appointments and that. Some like to come for a yearly checkup just to see how they're getting on. Mm -hmm. But most are doing all right. Good, good. Well, I think that's a nice note to, to wrap up on, um, that a significant number of women, seven out of 10, do notice that change or a significant change mm -hmm. um, in, in function. And I hope that for everyone watching and listening today, that that's been helpful, that the questions that you're able to answer today have given more hope and um, some kind of direction or guidance as to next steps and, and accessing the best route towards care. And hopefully um, we'll see you again next Friday, the 17th at 2 p.m. We'll be sending out an email with a link to the webinars that we've recorded. We did have some technical issues at the beginning, but we've captured most of it. <laughs> um, and there will be the chance to sign up for next week as well. Um, any final words, David? Oh, just to um, say that, yeah, keep the questions coming. And um, if there's anything that, you know, the, uh, you mentioned the deep dive. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got a question, um, and you think that we should, if there's a theme coming through and we can really deep, dig deep into a specific area, well, let's, um, let's do that then. I think um, um, what could be an outcome from this is that we do put more information on the website and we might even have some homework to do to come back to cover this at a future webinar. So I, I think it's a good opportunity now, especially with shut down in our in our country yeah so it yeah. seems the right time to do it Good. i'm mindful that a lot of gynecology services well just all the elective surgeries in hospitals have been cancelled and literally all the vulval clinic appointments i'm sure uh, and pain appointments and skin appointments have just simply been cancelled until the yeah. pandemic settles so that there may not be a lot of face-to-face uh, -face consultations for some time now um, so that's why we decided to do this web these webinars, didn't we, Sharon? Yeah, just absolutely. try and not fill a gap, but just at least perhaps provide some continuity of information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the email address is info i n f o at valvulpainsociety dot org. Um, can email with any more questions and. Absolutely, as David says, if we get uh, a theme coming through, we'll run a webinar or a Q&A in future. The next one is next Friday, the 17th at 2 p.m. Hopefully we'll welcome you then. Uh, thank you, Kay. I know you're there in the background dealing with any technical issues today. And uh, we'll see you all back here next time, hopefully. Thank you for joining us. Bye for now. Thank you.